Hey everyone, it's Emily, and it's been nearly two years since I last made a dedicated Nintendo Switch collection video on here, so I figured it was time to make an update. I'm one who really gravitates towards niche games, specifically JRPGs, visual novels, and some indie titles. So I really wanted to showcase those in this video, and of course, some of the first party Nintendo games I have and other popular franchises, and kind of just share an update of my current journey towards a curated collection. So before we get into all the games individually, I first wanted to share an overview of how I've organized my Nintendo Switch collection on my shelves behind me. I purchased these bookshelves on Amazon last year, and I always get questions about these. Um, I have a link in the description for those who are interested in them, but I really love how they work as media shelves. When it comes to storing Nintendo Switch games specifically, you can fit 48 games on each um, shelf level. So you see I have them kind of stored in four sections here. So that gives you an idea of how many Switch games I have at the moment. But these shelves are also great because they also have little areas where you can display collector's editions or figures or some other sort of gaming related items to help insert some unique interest into your shelving units. As I mentioned earlier, I am a curated collector, which means that I'm not so interested in picking shelving units that would maximize my space for each different game, but rather I just want to kind of house all the games I love as well as the other collectibles that I also love in a nice visually appealing way. So apart from the four sections where I have the red spines showing, I also have below that all of my Nintendo Switch steelbooks on display. I'm not much of a steelbook collector, but I've accumulated a few from either pre-order bonuses or from collector's editions of my favorite franchises. So I've had them neatly displayed down there. And then to the right, I also have another shelving unit that houses most of my RPG figures from my favorite franchises. As you see, this is where all of my Xenoblade stuff is, including the collector's editions. I also have a work in progress Zelda um, area that I'm hoping to incorporate a few more things um, down the line. And then below these, I also have my Kaseki or Trails series display area. Most of these are not Switch related. However, the two uh, collector's editions I have here for the Crossbell duology, Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure, are both for the Nintendo Switch console. Then right below that, I have my Fire Emblem shelf, where you can see three of my collector's editions for the Switch on display behind these figures. At the top right of my shelves, I also have a few other collector editions on display. I'm right next to all of my Pokemon and various gaming related plushes. And then I also have my Rune Factory 5 and Rune Factory 3 Special Collector Editions on display with uh, the Disgaea 1 Collector Edition also right behind that. So I do not alphabetize my games at all on my shelves. I instead prefer grouping them by genre as well as sorting them by franchise and publisher. So the upper right quadrant here is where the bulk of my JRPG collection is. And there's some spillover to the other shelves because that is the largest collection out of all my Switch games. Below that are where all of my visual novels are, um, though I do have some indie games that are in larger boxes also displayed on the shelf. The lower left section houses a lot of my indie titles and a few of the uh, larger boxes that some of them were released in. And then finally in the upper left is kind of where everything else settled. So I have a mix of different uh, indie games, JRPGs, and Nintendo first party titles. Again, sort of loosely organized by genre and publisher. So I find this a lot easier for me personally to locate games on my shelves rather than alphabetized. Um, I know most people prefer alphabetized and if that works for them, that's great. But I think because I am so genre focused when it comes to my curated collecting, um, this just made the most sense for me. All right, so that's a brief overview of how I like to organize my Nintendo Switch games. So now I'm going to attempt to efficiently talk about each individual game um, and hopefully um, spend a little bit more time on some of the more niche games that you may have never heard of or didn't realize had a physical release. And um, also group these by genre just for the sake of time. Uh, starting with the Trails games. So I have a lot of Trails games on the Switch and um, this is mostly because I've allowed myself to double dip on the Switch as well as PlayStation. And I think out of all of these, owning the Crossbell duology, so Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure, um, is the best way to go if you want to play these games. Um, you can, of course, buy this digitally, but if you are a physical media collector like myself, um, these have more um, enhancements um, 
than the PlayStation version does. The same could be said with the spinoff game, um, Nayuta Boundless Trails, uh, that I have here as well. Um, it's a great option for the Switch. The two Cold Steel games are also uh, viable ways to play uh, these games, though you may want to go with the PlayStation versions because unfortunately you don't have the first two games available in English on the Switch. And at this point, it seems very unlikely that the first two games are going to be ported um, out here in the West. Um, at this point. I currently do not have Reverie or Trails to uh, Daybreak on the Switch. Um, I opted for the PS5 versions for that because performance-wise they do run a little better um, and there are some performance issues um, noted on the Switch versions uh, for these two. So that's something to kind of keep in mind um, if you're looking uh, to also collect this a great but niche JRPG series. And the other Falcom games that you could get on the Switch are the Ease games. Um, I have one that is technically not published by NAS America, but um, I have this anyway. Um, this I think you get from the limited run storefront on Amazon, and that is Ease Origin. Um, there's also um, Ease 8 and Ease 9. It used to be that a lot of these JRPGs published through NAS America would sell out and not get reprinted. But thankfully, we've been seeing a lot more reprints in the last year, especially through Video Games Plus. That has kind of made a relationship with uh, various publishers to get reprints for out-of-print games. Now, regarding Ease 8 and Ease 9, I think Ease 8 is a natural fit for the Switch. So if you could find a copy of this for a reasonable price, I think that is a good way to go. Ease 9, on the other hand, may be something you want to avoid. This unfortunately has a mandatory download, which is something that I've become more aware of within especially the past year and um, have really tried to avoid in my Switch collection because anything where you have a mandatory download in order to access the game kind of uh, limits your ownership of the game um, and kind of defeats the purpose of owning it physically, in my opinion. So it's probably better to get either a PS4 or PS5 version of this, uh, if possible. I haven't played too far in the Switch version of this, um, but from what I did play, even after the big mandatory download, it is rather janky. So again, probably best to avoid um, on this. Then I have a few different games from Furu that NAS America published, um, including The Clothes Effect 2, um, The Lions Alive, and Crystar. Um, all these I do recommend. Um, there is a first Kligo Effect game that got a reprint semi-recently through Video Games Plus. I decided to pass on it because I've just heard nothing but bad things about the first game and, and how the second game here was just so much better in about every way. The Alliance Alive as well as Not Shown uh, Legend of Legacy were 3DS titles that got Switch uh, HD remasters and I think they're great ways to experience the game. I personally prefer The Alliance Alive. Um, I haven't played through all of uh, Legend of Legacy yet, um, but uh, this has really good characters and a good battle mechanic that I, I do recommend. And then I also have Crystar here, which was um, all supported over from the PS4 originally, and I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I've heard it's a pretty good action RPG with some pretty good storytelling. Um, we have some Disgaea games that if you like really quirky, over-the-top um, strategy RPGs, um, this might be something to definitely look into, um, especially if you're really interested in maximizing the damage you do to certain parties. Um, so I do think out of all these, um, the fifth one might be the one to go with. I've heard really good things about the seventh one that I've been thinking of picking up as well, but um, that's just in the future down the line for me. Um, I don't personally own a lot of first person dungeon crawlers on the Nintendo Switch, but I do have um, Labyrinth of Refrain and Galleria of Refrain. Um, they're both considered rather mature for, I think, the genre, but I've, I've heard really good things about the characters and customization abilities um, when building your party. Um, so um, these might be ones definitely to look into um, if you're interested in this genre. And then for some Nippon Ichi software, I do have The Liar Princess and The Blind Prince as well as The Cruel King and The Great Hero. So these are both considered quasi JRPGs. I would say more so The Cruel King and The Great Hero has a rather relaxed uh, turn-based system, whereas this is more of a platformer. Um, but I do just house them both on my shelf because they um, are developed by the same company and have a very similar art style. Um, and these are some of my sealed JRPGs that are in my collection right now that I haven't opened yet. Um, this is mostly because I've been debating about getting these on the PS5 because I ended up with a PAL version for the first game, um, Fallen Legion Rise of Glory, and then also have the uh, North American version for uh, the next game, um, Fallen Legion Reverence. So 
That's kind of why these have been unplayed and unwrapped so far. But this is sort of an interesting fusion um, with some visual novel elements, I want to say, um, just based off of what I've seen about these games and real-time RPG elements um, in a kind of a 2D side-scroller view. Um, so definitely, I would say, unique titles on the Switch. And the last two JRPGs that were published by NAS America that I have currently is Langrisser 1 and 2 and uh, God Wars. So both of these are out of print and unfortunately God Wars has been delisted. So the only way to play this game on the Switch is to find a physical copy. Um, thankfully, you can still find physical copies of this rather easily. I must say Video Games Plus still may have this in stock. Um, but these are both uh, strategy RPGs. They both play a little bit differently. Um, this is more of a traditional kind of Fire Emblem-like, whereas the Langrisser games are a little bit different in that uh, you move different armies that will kind of battle all at once in different parties um, rather than individual characters. So next are all these Square Enix games that I currently own. A few of these are published by Nintendo, but I still like to group them with my Square Enix titles. I'm starting with Dragon Quest. So I have um, 11, as well as Dragon Quest Builders 2. I really want to expand more of my Dragon Quest games. I especially want to get the latest one on Dragon Quest Monsters uh, that was released last year into the collection at some point. Um, but yeah, these are definitely easy recommendations. So really good games. And I have Bravely Default 2 here, which I haven't given a go yet because I want to play the 3DS games first that I have um, behind me. But I've heard really good things about this and I feel like it kind of flew under the radar when it came out. And it's kind of having a resurgence of um, appreciation right now. Then we have Triangle Strategy here, which overall is a good game. I really liked the strategy RPG elements in this that I really hope they expand upon, maybe in a sequel of some sorts. Regarding the decision making and the story, I was a little underwhelmed overall. Um, I like the idea of making decisions, but I feel like some of the decisions had little to no consequence um, to the overall narrative, but yeah, that was just kind of my small qualm about it. And then I do have both Octopath Traveler games here. I need to get back to the first game. I put it down after getting a little bit bored. Um, so I just need to, I think, Get, be in the right mindset uh, to play this type of game, um, your traditional turn-based combat with a little bit of a grind to it, um, less focus on the plot and more of kind of just the atmosphere. So um, I've heard the second game though is really good. So I'm looking forward to getting into this eventually. And then I also have uh, Tactics Ogre Reborn and I'm looking forward to getting into this as well. I've heard again, really good things about it, though um, it can be a little bit more uh, difficult compared to some other strategy RPGs I've showed already, um, especially with the level capping. Um, but I am curious how this will go for me. And then I have these three Final Fantasy games on the Switch. Um, I got the uh, Final Fantasy uh, collection uh, one through six from Play Asia well, because the North American version had a whole fiasco. Um, and honestly, I think this is the better version because you do get the inside cover art with all the little uh, pixel characters that are cute. I also picked up um, 10 and 10.2 on Play Asia um, because the Asian English version is fully on the cart. Um, if you buy this from other regions, unfortunately, the size of the game cartridge is small. And so the 10.2 game is a download only. But if you um, buy this version, they're both there on the cart for anyone who's also interested in kind of video game ownership when it comes to physical media. And then for 12th here, um, this is one of my favorite games on the PS2 back in the day, but I have yet to play the uh, Zodiac Age uh, just because of how uh, vast my backlog is. It feels weird for me to return to some games I've played already, though I've of course made exceptions of that over the years. But yeah, I'm gonna see how they've changed this because I've heard that a lot of the different mechanics of how they handled the Gambit system and the different skill trees is a little bit different than what they did on the PS2 era. Then I have the Trials of Mana remaster um, that I've heard really good things about. Um, it's not supposed to be super long, so I want to try this out before Visions of Mana comes out because that game looks incredible and I feel like this will give me a good idea of how the Mana games play because I've yet to play a Mana game. And then another Asian English game I have from Square Enix is uh, Chrono Cross and I want to play uh, Chrono Trigger first, which I have on the DS behind me uh, before uh, trying this game. I know they're Two different games but i am kind of curious of what kind of ties them together and i feel like playing them chronologically makes the most sense and they also own another sequel that has the first part available on the ds that i need to play first and that is neo the world ends with you 
and I've heard this is actually a pretty good upgrade. Um, when they remade um, the first uh, The World Ends With You game on the Switch, um, I kept hearing everyone say to avoid that because the controls are just too clunky. And uh, as a handheld gamer, I, I felt like it was better to experience that on the DS rather than on the Switch. So I need to do that first uh, before getting to this one. And then I also, of course, have Nier Autonoma on the Switch. Um, I actually owned this on the PS4 originally, um, but unfortunately that version has a download code for LLDLC, whereas this one includes it on the cart. So um, even though this is 30 frames per second rather than 60, that's something that doesn't really bother me personally, especially because I play handheld mostly. So I'm looking forward to um, getting to this game because I've heard again nothing but good things about this. And the last one I own is a Japanese import and that is Oniaki. Um, this does have, I believe, a PAL version available, um, but it was never released in North America. So that's why I went with the Japanese import version because I think I got it rather cheaply. Uh, this is my only Tokyo RPG Factory game I have on the Switch right now. I kind of want to pick up a few more like The Lost Fear and a few other titles, even though I've heard big things about them, but um, I think they're, they are games I want to experience at least. All right, so next are all the Koei Tecmo Gust titles that I own. So I have Blue Reflection Second Light here on the Switch. Um, I own the first game on the PS4. And part of me kind of wishes I got this game also on the PS4 um, because I do like it when I have a franchise on the same uh, platform, um, but this still plays pretty well on the Switch from what I hear. I also, of course, own all the Atelier games on the Switch as well. I think the Switch is a great way to um, play these games. Um, specifically, we have Atelier Marie that came out last year. Um, it's a nice short experience that I wouldn't necessarily recommend for those uh, unfamiliar with the series, um, but I think those who are fans of the franchise will really dig this um, because of just how sweet it is. So Atelier Marie you can only buy physically in Asia. Uh, thankfully it includes English on the cart and a few of the other trilogies are also available on Play Asia with English on the cart, including the Dusk trilogy, which I highly recommend because it is complete on the cart. Um, there's no downloads required and um, Aisha was my first Atelier game that I found just so charming. Uh, I definitely recommend it. Um, even though there are time limits in this particular trilogy, um, they weren't too uh, harsh in my opinion. You could also get the first three games in the Mysterious trilogy on Play Asia with English. Unfortunately, these do have some downloads, um, but they are mostly available on the cart. For whatever reason, the Arland trilogy is not available physically anywhere. Um, I don't know why Koei Tecmo decided that, but, but you can get the fourth game, Atelier Lula, um, physically here. And the Rise of Trilogy is also comes highly recommended by me. Um, I love these games. And I do recommend playing at least this trilogy in order um, if possible. Um, because I feel like you just get so attached to the characters and um, you just really see their growth um, over the course of the three games. That's very rewarding and satisfying once you reach the end. I will say that the third game, it is graphically intensive because it's more of an open world sort of experience. So it may be best played elsewhere, like on the PS5. Though um, I did play this on the Switch and didn't have that many problems. So um, I do recommend it if that's the only way uh, you could play this game because these are really great, charming RPGs that you really shouldn't miss out on. Then lastly, I have Atelier Sophie 2. Um, I first need to play the Mysterious Trilogy before getting to this one, but I've heard all the alchemy and battle systems are even better in this game, so I'm really looking forward to it. So next are the Sega and Atlas titles that I own physically, uh, starting with Valkyria Chronicles 4. And for some reason, this is one of the oldest games in my Switch collection, but I've yet to play it. Um, I've really looking forward to it because strategy RPGs are one of my favorite subgenres. Um, but I, I think the four kind of intimidates me and makes me want to play some of the earlier games before getting into this one. So that's kind of why I've held off. And then next we have 13 Sentinels Aegis Brim, which is another excellent game that I'm glad they ported over to the Switch. Um, this is uh, from Vanillaware and there's a lot of Vanillaware titles that are slowly coming out on the Switch. And I really want to pick up Unicorn Overlord. I unfortunately haven't yet, but it's definitely on my list. But uh, 13 Sentinels is a great game. It's more of a visual novel RPG hybrid because it does incorporate a lot of dialogue and storytelling and kind of mixes it with some tower defense, real-time strategy, um, battle mechanics. So 
highly recommend this if you haven't experienced this yet. I also have two Shimigami Tensei games. Um, the first one is here, um, Nocturne, and um, this is a remake of the PS2 game that I have yet to play. Um, I do hear it's rather difficult, but I want to say this remaster is a little bit easier than the original, but I don't quote me on that. And then I also have the Steelbook version for SMT5, and I've yet to play this, and I'm kind of glad I held off because seemingly the trend with a lot of Atlas titles is that a definitive version comes out a few years later, and so we're going to have Vengeance, uh, which adds, I think, an extra 80 hours to this game with a new route. So uh, I don't even know if I'm going to get that for the Switch. I might just get that for the PS5, but I haven't decided yet. And then regarding Persona games, I just have... Uh, Persona 5 Royal right now on the Switch, though I do have orders of Persona 4 Golden and uh, Persona 3 Portable coming eventually from Linda Run Games, um, whenever that decides to show up. And lastly for Alice is one that was published through Nintendo, and that is Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE Encore. And I actually really enjoyed this game. I know people are rather mixed about it, but I feel like the battle mechanics are just so fun and the dashes of idol culture and some other uh, things with like Shibuya in Japan. It's just so fun. Um, and it's one that I would recommend, especially if you in are into niche RPGs. So speaking of Nintendo, I'll now get into the first party Nintendo JRPGs, uh, starting with Fire Emblem. So I do have three houses here, the Collector's Edition Steelbook. I do want to get the standard uh, case. However, I've noticed that they haven't revised the cartridge for three houses yet, or no one's really discovered it yet and put it on um, the revised uh, cartridge uh, spreadsheet yet. And so I've been patiently waiting for that because there is a sizable download that you have to do through a patch um, on the original game. Uh, so hopefully someday that will happen. And then I also have Fire Emblem Engage here, which I really hope gets revised as well because this has nearly four gigabytes of downloads that you have to do to play it, which is pretty sizable for a Nintendo Switch game. Um, but uh, contrary to what a lot of people thought, I thought this was also a good entry in the Fire Emblem franchise. It's different than Three Houses for sure, but I feel like the combat here just really shined. And I personally enjoyed the graphics and the character illustrations. Um, they're very quirky, but I feel like you got to know them a little better further into the story through the character supports, uh, which maybe should have been highlighted more in the beginning, for turning a lot of people off, but overall I thought this was a good game. And then I also have the two warrior games for Fire Emblem that I get to play. Uh, someday I'll get to them, I promise. And then we have the Xenoblade Chronicles games, which are also some of my favorite games on the Switch just in general, if not some of my favorite JRPGs of all time. I highly recommend all these games. I feel like they're just so unique, um, not only with the battle mechanics, but in the storytelling and all the characters and um, you definitely, I think once you get into Xenoblade, uh, you never leave. All right, so now getting into some of the Bandai Namco games, starting with .hack.gu. Um, I picked this up physically on the Bandai Namco storefront. Unfortunately, I think it's out of print now, but you can buy the Japanese version and it includes uh, the English language on there. So if you wanted a physical copy of these uh, PS2 ports on the Switch, um, that's definitely, I think, something worth looking into. There's also now a couple of Tales of games on the Switch. I just have Tales of Asperia. I did think about getting Tales of Symphonia, but that Switch port, unfortunately, was not done very well. Um, I think Bandai Noko even apologized after releasing it, saying they'll do better in the future. So that's one I think definitely to skip on the Switch and get on the PS4 if possible. Or of course, if you have um, the previous versions of that game, I'll just maybe stick to those. But if you really want to play the game, I don't see a reason why you shouldn't get it on the Switch if you want to experience it. And then I also have the two Nino Kuna games um, that were from Level 5 in collaboration with Studio Ghibli with the art direction. I've got to play these, but I've heard nothing but good things and I really need to experience these at some point. <laughs> and then lastly, I do have this Digimon game, um, Digimon Cyber Sleuth the complete edition. So this includes the first and second game. And I think this is a great way to experience these. Um, I find these really fun, actually. Um, if you like the SMT demon fusion system, um, you get to do that basically with Digimon. And I spent countless hours doing that myself. And I do think story-wise, um, it is, it's fun. You, you play a detective and kind of go around solving different uh, cases. Uh, next are all of my Idea Factory JRPGs. 
Uh, so I do have the Death End Request games here um, that were originally on the PS4, but received Switch ports that play rather decently, I think, on the Switch. And then these two were actually distributed by Limited Run Games, so I'm not sure how easy they are to obtain at the moment. Um, they weren't limited numbered, so they may have reprinted these. Um, so if you're interested in these, um, they're kind of quirky. Um, they're definitely not a traditional JRPG, but if you are open to trying something new, they, these might be something worth looking into. So next are some of the Exceed or Marvelous games that I have. I'm um, starting with the Rune Factory games. Um, overall, I think these are great ways to experience Rune Factory games, especially if you don't already have um, four and three on the DS or 3DS. And these are enhanced, so this includes a lot of extra content and are graphically upgraded as well. Um, um, Rune Factory 5 um, is also available on the Switch and on PC, but if you're concerned about performance and graphics, definitely go with the PC rather than the Switch version. I was waiting for the longest time to see if this would get um, updated, um, especially with some of the performance issues I was experiencing when I got this around launch. And unfortunately, those were never resolved, so I've yet to actually go back to this game. But what I did play was fun. It, just some of the performance issues, I guess, hindered my enjoyment of it overall, though. And then another RPG that incorporates some farming elements is the Kun of Rice and Ruin, which I haven't played a ton of yet. I've just kind of sampled it, if you will. Um, and overall, I thought it was fun, uh, though I can see the drawback of having to rely on the farming system in order to kind of make some advancements in the game. So uh, definitely keep that in mind um, if that's a concern of yours. And then for another Musou type game, I have uh, Fade Extello, The Emerald Star. And there's another game that's very similar to this. I'm forgetting the title that's also involved in this universe um, that I'm hoping to get at some point because I am kind of a casual fan of the Fate franchise. And I do want to experience these games at some point. And so there are a few more RPGs I want to cover before moving on to another subgenre. And these are sort of one-offs um, from various publishers. Um, these are both from P Cube, um, Cat Quest 1 and 2, as well as Potion Permit. I adore the Cat Quest games, and um, this is technically just Cat Quest 2, but it does have the first game as a free download. Um, so I really want to get the first game on the cart at some point, because again, I really like these games. Potion Permit, on the other hand, is actually getting a new physical release that includes all of the DLC. <laughs> so I feel like this is kind of obsolete um, if you are a physical Switch uh, collector who likes complete on cart games. So I might need to uh, upgrade my copy uh, sometime soon. But this is very similar to Rune Factory, but instead of having farming elements in the game, you are instead gathering different herbs and things to make potions and uh, create medicine for uh, this village. Um, so definitely one to check out if you are a little fatigued of the farming simulator RPG type of games. Uh, these next two games are one I kind of regret buying on the Switch. Uh, the first one is Disco Elysium, the Final Cut version. And I regret getting this because of how it performs on the Switch, as well as the massive download you have to do. So I'm actually thinking of getting rid of this copy and upgrading to the PS5 copy that's still available on the I Am 8-Bit website. So this is actually a great RPG that's very different from what RPGs typically are. Um, I haven't played all the way through it. I just kind of put it in to see how it runs, to see if I wanted to keep this my Switch copy or not. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to upgrade this to a PS5 copy sometime in the near future. And the other game I kind of regret buying on the Switch is again, not because it's a bad game, it's just I don't like it on the Switch itself. And that is CrossCode. So this was originally a PC game and I think you can kind of tell. And I just had the most difficult time playing this on handheld mode, um, especially on the light when that was the only Switch system I owned at the time. I've yet to try this with a Pro controller in the dock Switch, so I'm gonna do that first before deciding what I do with my copy here, because again, it's a great game, especially if you like the puzzle elements in various Zelda games, and um, from the five or so hours I played of it, I enjoyed the story and all the different graphics and things. So yeah, I'll have to give this a new, another go at some point. So these last few games are various strategy RPGs that I own from different publishers. Um, the first few are from PM Studios, and that is the Mercenaries games. So these are Japanese developed games, and they're not really 
be considered top tier strategy RPGs, but they have made improvements with each different iteration of their games. So you can get the first three games in this collection here, the Mercenary Saga Chronicles. Um, and then Limited Run also published a few of these um, with, I guess, PM uh, Studios, um, including Mercenaries Wings here, um, the False Phoenix, and uh, Mercenaries Blaze of the Twin Dragons. Um, there's another game that I have yet to get um, that came out last year that thankfully wasn't just distributed through Limited Run Games, but um, you could get from, I think, at retail that I want to also track down at some point, because uh, even though these are not considered the best strategy RPGs, they're still considered fairly good, and I'm curious to see how they improve with each um, different iteration. Um, this is another import that I got because I unfortunately missed the boat when it came to the limited run published game. So we have um, Brigadine, The Legend of Rosinia, and uh, this is rather unique in that it has, instead of a traditional grid-like uh, board that you move various parties around, um, has more of a hexagonal um, option. So it uh, lends itself to more unique uh, ways to look at strategy and deploying uh, the various monsters and characters um, from your party. So uh, I haven't tried this yet, but I've heard pretty good things. And um, this is, I think, a classic formula that it's nice to see on the Switch. And then lastly here, I have Other Side, which is more of an indie uh, strategy RPG. Um, I got this through Limit Run Games, but I think they eventually put this on their storefront and I think they're trying to clearance it out through uh, Woot or something for a little bit. Um, but overall, um, I've heard pretty good things about this. I haven't tried it myself yet, um, but I really like the aesthetic, the black and white with the splashes of red. And it was kind of an interesting concept where each of the characters were um, like your daughters or something and had an interesting uh, strategy mechanic built into it. So last but not least, I'm gonna tack on some Western RPGs to my GRPG segment. And I don't think the Nintendo Switch is necessarily the best place uh, for Western RPGs. And it has to do more with the graphical limitations. Um, I feel like most of these games, you could get a better experience elsewhere. But uh, they're still, I think, suitable games to play on the Switch, especially if you are into console gaming and want the handheld experience. For example, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Complete Edition, um, I thought was a fun time on the Switch. And this is the first way I've experienced The Witcher 3. I wanna get the PS5 version eventually um, because it's one of my favorite games of all time. And I do feel like it was a pretty solid experience on the Switch, especially at least in handheld mode. Um, I also have Skyrim here that I haven't played on the Switch yet. I've heard it's not too bad. Um, there's a sizable download though that I've only recently realized, um, but I think like that's kind of inevitable with a lot of these Western RPGs is the sizable downloads. And then I also have Immortals Phoenix Rising, which is also a good game, though I do own this on the PS5 now that I got for like $5, so I don't really need this copy anymore. And I do feel like it performs a little bit better on the PS5, to say the least. But of course, if you only own a Switch, I do think um, playing Immortals Phoenix Rising is definitely well worth it um, because it is a pretty cool kind of twist on the Breath of the Wild formula with the Greek mythology. So now I'm gonna go through all of my first party Nintendo Switch games that are not RPGs. Um, so first with some obvious ones, um, here are all of my Zelda games. So I of course own Breath of the Wild, uh, Tears of the Kingdom, which I still haven't beat. I put this down shortly after launch, feeling a little bit overwhelmed and uh, didn't pick it up for the longest time. But um, over winter break last year, I picked it up again and got quite far into it. Uh, but again, I put it down thinking I'll return to it someday. But overall, I thought it was fun. Um, it didn't quite capture me as much as Breath of the Wild did, which I think makes sense because this is very much an anomaly when it came out. But that's not to say that uh, Tears of the Kingdom is still a great experience, and it was really interesting to see the new um, mechanics they added to it. Then I have another Musou game that I've yet to play. I still need to get Hyrule Warriors, um, the first one. Um, that one's a little bit harder to track down right now, at least here in North America. 
um, but I do have Age of Calamity. And then I have the remake for Link's Awakening, which was a fun time. I really enjoyed this. Uh, this is the first time I played Link's Awakening and I really enjoyed it because I, I do like 2D Zelda a lot. And then for Skyward Sword, I've been a little bit intimidated to try it, um, mostly because I've heard some not so great things about it. Um, but I've also heard that it's an upgrade from the Wii version because you're not forced to use motion controls, which is very much a plus for me. So I'll have to give it a try at some point. Now, when it comes to Mario, it might sound a little odd that I only own two Mario games. Um, them being Super Mario Odyssey and Mario plus Rapids Kingdom Battle, which is technically not even a Nintendo published game. I'm not a Mario hater. I just haven't really felt inspired to collect Mario at this point because I feel like it's not going to run out of print anytime soon. And I didn't really have a desire to get the 3D All-Stars package when it came out. So I don't feel bad that I missed the boat on that personally. But there are a few different Mario games that I do want to pick up eventually. I'm just not in too much of a hurry because I feel like they printed out so many of those. I, I'll get it eventually. Now, when it comes to Platinum Studios, I own the first Bayonetta game and I don't have the other two because I want to try it out first before committing to the second and the third game. I feel like I'll really enjoy it because I do like action games and I actually really loved Astral Chain. Um, I thought this was an excellent game and would love to see a sequel someday. But yeah, I'm holding off on getting more Bayonetta games until I try the first. And my Pokemon collection is rather sparse at the moment as well. I only own three games right now. Um, I have Pokemon Legends Arceus, which I thought was fun. I didn't complete it because I got a little bit fatigued with the catching mechanic and I didn't really want to fill out the entire Pokedex to move on to the next areas. Um, someday I might return to it because I did find it novel, um, the change in the formula, but yeah, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. Um, I also have Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, uh, which I also played. Um, this is my first experience with this generation of Pokemon, and I thought it was all right. I know a lot of people didn't like the uh, graphical uh, features of this or how it didn't have um, the platinum upgrades that was on the original DS versions, but I think it was overall fun. Like it was what I expected of Pokemon. And then lastly, I have Pokemon Sword um, plus the expansion pass version. And I've yet to try Sword out. I'm a little bit nervous because I've heard not so many great things, but I definitely want to give it a try at some point. Um, I've yet to pick up Pokemon Scarlet or Violet. I was hoping that the expansion version would include the entire expansion pass on it, but it only includes half of it. So right now I'm just waiting to see if uh, Nintendo is going to re-release re that with the full DLC on it or not. All right, so I did kind of miss this in my RPG section. I do have Monster Hunter Stories 2 here, and they are coming out with um, a new package that includes the first remaster game, along with a download code for Monster Hunter Stories 2. So I might end up getting that, though it does look like the Japanese version only includes the 3DS remake on the cart, and also includes English for much cheaper than the double pack they're trying to sell. So um, I might incorporate that in the collection at some point. And I also have um, Okami HD here as well. Um, it's sealed because I played this game already um, on my brother's Switch, um, but I really wanted to have a physical copy um, to own myself um, because it's definitely a unique game and it's great that it's available on the Switch. So regarding um, platformers, I own these three on the Switch right now. Um, Raymond Legends, um, Tie the Tasmanian Tiger plus two, and um, Oddworld Collection. And I will say that there is a large download for this. Um, I think only the first game is available on the cart, uh, though it does come with a little uh, USB boomerang. That was kind of neat. So I'm a little bit torn about this because it's not available fully on the disc anywhere. So that's why it's still in my collection. And uh, Rayman Legends is definitely a classic, uh, definitely worth getting. Um, you may have noticed that I no longer own Spyro HD on the Switch because that required um, a download. Um, so that's why I ended up selling that game and hoping to get the PS4 version that's complete on disc at some point because I really do enjoy platformers um, on occasion. And then the other sort of one-off game I have is a farming simulator. That is Stories of Seasons, Friends of Mineral Town. And I've never tried a full on Story of Seasons or Harvest Moon game. I've only tried the uh, Rune Factory games. So 
figured I might as well try this at some point and uh, see how I take to them. So I have four more games I want to squeeze in here before I get into the indie section. And these are all published through Nicolas. And I feel rather torn about owning them, which is why they're still in the shrink wrap. And I kind of got these a little bit on FOMO because a lot of the Nicolas games at the time, um, I bought these were going out of print and being very difficult to find. Um, starting with this Coda Princess EX version, the 15th anniversary edition, um, Cave Story uh, Plus, um, this alternative cover art variant, I think with the Japanese art on it. Um, Winter Boy and the Dragon's Trap, and Remy Lore, uh, The Lost Girl um, in the Lands of the Lore. I think these are not bad games to own. I just have been trying to, again, curate my collection and size it down to games that I know I'll get to and play and really enjoy. I think out of all these, I do maybe want to keep Remy Lore because it's sort of like a Diablo clone. Um, and I do look kind of like Magical Girl sort of themed things. I'm also a little torn about Wonder Boy because I do like the idea of the art style here with the kind of hand-drawn aesthetic and the sort of 2D platformer with some action elements. But yeah, I just don't know when I'll get around to this. So I feel like this probably belongs in a better home than mine. Um, similar with uh, Cave Story, um, this has kind of a weird history and I feel a little bit weird owning this on the Switch. And uh, it's another game I just don't see myself getting around to anytime soon, um, along with Coda Princess EX, which is more of a beat em up game. I know it was really popular on the uh, 3DS back in the day and got it kind of expensive. So um, having this um, accessible on the Switch, I thought was a good way to maybe experience that because I am a big 3DS collector. Um, but yeah, I just don't see myself getting into this because I don't really enjoy beat em ups all that much. This video is getting rather long, so I'll try to speed through these a little bit. But first are my Supergiant games I own on the Switch. Um, I have both Hades and Transistor. Um, this is a limited run game, so unfortunately this is a little bit difficult to get. Though there was a Best Buy variant that you could usually find a little bit cheaper secondhand. Um, Hades, I think, is a wonderful game. It's one of my favorite games of all time. However, I don't think owning this on the Switch is necessarily the best format um, because there is quite a substantial download patch you have to do. <laughs> so um, I've been thinking of actually rebuying this on the PS5, which I think doesn't require such a large download. Now I don't own too many Metroidvanias, but I do kind of want to correct that because I do feel like it's a genre that I would enjoy. Um, I just need to, again, kind of uh, take the time to try it out. So I do, of course, own um, Hollow Knight here, which is a classic, as well as the two Ori games that I have the collector's edition for. Um, I do hear that these are a little bit more approachable than Hollow Knight, so I might try these first. And I also have Ender Lilies, which I got through limited run games. Um, however, I do think there's an Asian English version you could get and import that fairly easily now. Um, there's also a sequel coming out that I'm excited for because um, I really like kind of the dark fantasy aesthetic they went for in this. There's also a few indie imports that I picked up from the PAL region, including um, Eyelids here, which is kind of considered a cozy Metroidvania game. And I also have um, a short hike here, which I adore. Um, this is such a cozy game. <laughs> I, I really like it. Um, and then more recently, Little Gator here, which is sort of a childlike approach to the 3D Zelda formula that I'm looking forward to. Then I also have Heaven's Vault here from Strictly Limited Games that um, really intrigued me. Um, because it uses kind of these language puzzles. Um, so it's a play on some linguistics um, in kind of almost a visual novel format, or maybe more of a uh, point and click adventure is maybe a more accurate description. And um, yeah, it's one I've been meaning to try out um, and see how it goes. And then um, I also have the PAL version of Wargroove because the North American version was very difficult to find, but it does seem like they're actually releasing a new physical game in Japan that includes English um, with both uh, Wargroove and the sequel very soon. So I'm curious if we'll be seeing um, something similar in North America or um, the PAL region. And we have Untitled Deku's game, which I think is a lot of fun. And there is a co-op mode 
that I've yet to try, but I've heard is also just kind of hilarious. So I might need to replay this someday. And if you're into puzzle games, um, Manifold Garden is lovely, um, especially if you like architecture. And then I have the retail version of Gree here, uh, which is a beautiful platformer game. I love the watercolor aesthetic and all the graphics. Um, it was just a very lovely short experience. Then I also have Spirit Fear that I played and really enjoyed. It's a cozy management game. Um, where you uh, kind of ferry across um, these various spirits um, uh, unto their next life. And um, there are some very uh, sad emotional moments in here, but overall I thought it was really enjoyable. I did have some performance issues on the Switch, so if possible, you might want to pick this up on a different system. So I did experience a few crashes in this game, but other than that, it was still very playable. And then there's Eastward here, which got a huge new DLC with um, some farming elements in it. So I'm curious if they're going to release a new physical copy incorporating that. I've yet to actually play this. Um, it's described as kind of very similar to a top-down Zelda-like title, um, just in a dystopian future. So. That's one I've been meaning to play. Then I also have another Zelda-like title, um, Blossom Tales 2, and um, the Limited Run version. And I will admit, I kind of bought into the FOMO of this because I noticed that the first game um, that Limited Run also worked on kind of shot through the roof. <laughs> so I didn't want to miss out on the sequel here. That was supposed to be pretty good. Um, another FOMO purchase that I'm kind of questioning if I'll ever get to it is Gunvolt Strikers 3. I haven't played the first two games. I know they were originally released on the 3DS, but there's also a striker pack with the first two games available on the Switch. Um, and uh, these are described kind of like the Mega Man style of gameplay that I haven't had too much experience with, so I don't really know if I really like them. <laughs> so I kind of bought this to see and test the waters if I like this type of game, but I've yet to actually play it, so. I still don't know if that's the case or not. Then I have um, this Grim Fandango uh, version with the slip case um, from I Am 8-Bit. And this is a classic uh, point and click adventure game from Double Fine Games that I wanted to play because I really love Psychonauts. Um, so someday I'll get to this. And then from the first part of my special reserves uh, collection, I have a card shark here, which is a lot of fun. It's a kind of a unique twist on the card playing game in that you're not actually playing cards, but uh, you're using kind of magic tricks in order to deceive people. And uh, it takes place, I think, during the French Revolution era. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I highly recommend this if you haven't played it yet. And I also have the reserve versions for four of their titles, um, starting with uh, Death's Door, which um, is a lot of fun. Um, it's sort of a top-down, isometric, um, Souls-like game. Um, that I didn't find too challenging, like a Souls-like game, but um, it was still a very cool experience. Um, and then next I have Got a Roboto here, which I kind of bought on a whim uh, because I was starting to get into more of the reserve versions of Special Reserve. Um, but this is sort of when they started going downhill with issues of their physical releases. So uh, be careful if you find an original cart of this game. It requires a download patch in order to play it. And I also have Inscription here, uh, which is a card-like game, which is something I usually avoid, but I've heard just so many great things about this game and the horror elements just sounds intriguing that um, I really want to play this sometime around Halloween, I think this year. And finally, I have my copy of Cult of the Lamb that also had some controversy. And this is sort of when Special Reserve Games announced that they will no longer be publishing games directly. They'll instead um, be helping Devolver publish their own games and just be working on the, uh, I think, art design and some of the art books and stuff, which it's probably for the best after all their um, controversies. Um, and so after all the delays with this game, I've yet to play it. <laughs> but um, I just love the kind of cozy, cute aesthetic with the rather kind of dark themes. So to get more into some of the limited print games that unfortunately might be a little tricky to get a hold of nowadays, so I have these two from Premium Edition Games. One is an RPG, uh, Phenotopia Awakening, that was originally a, a Flash release that got really popular and it's cool to see it on the Switch now. And then I also have Raji, an ancient epic that I've yet to play, um, but it's kind of a um, action game with some light platforming elements. So these next few ones are from Limited Run Games, and I'm excluding the ones that are visual novels because I'll have those in the visual novel section later on. But I do have the first two games of the Oceanhorn series here. 
And so uh, these are described as Zelda-like adventures, and um, this one's more like um, isometric top-down Zelda, whereas the sequel is more like uh, the 3D Zelda. And I've heard rather positive things about them. I did, however, kind of FOMO by these because I noticed they were re-releasing the first Ocean Horn games in this little box set. So I kind of jumped on it because of that and slight regrets because um, I haven't played these yet. Um, but I really like Zelda, so I feel like any Zelda-like I'm probably also enjoy. But the problem is I have so many Zelda-like games I've yet to get to, so uh, they're starting to accumulate, which is not good for my curation strategy. <laughs> and then we have Anno Mutation in here, which um, I really enjoy. I'm, I'm glad I found about this because I saw it had great reviews. It was a cyberpunk um, game with uh, side-scrolling action and RPG elements, and I ended up really enjoying this actually. I also have RFL and Rise of the Third Power that I've heard really good things about. Um, I've yet to play them, but this was another FOMO buy that I hope I don't regret down the line once I do get to them. Um, then I have Garden Story here, um, which looked really cute and kind of reminded me of uh, some of the cozy RPGs uh, that I want to get more into. Um, I do have Bug Fables here, and I got this because I've never played Paper Mario before and heard um, this was actually a pretty good um, Paper Mario-like uh, game with some funny dialogue. So I'll have to give this a go and see if I like that formula or not. And another one I've heard nothing but good things about is Nine in the Woods. And I'm glad I bought this. Um, I just need to make time to play it. Um, I just love the art style and um, kind of the overall message um, about kind of finding yourself. It's sort of, I think, a coming of age uh, story that deals with, I think, some depression themes. And some other games I kind of film about because after uh, one of the games just shot up in value on the Switch, I felt like I needed to buy them um, in order to not miss out. And that's these Shantae games. And I think Shantae is a great series. I just haven't gone around to playing all the games yet. So I have these two, um, yeah, the first Shantae and Rescue's Revenge, as well as an import copy of The Seven Sirens. So I did talk about a few games that I kind of feel like I might not ever get to, and I'm afraid Shantae might be one of those games, even though I do like my female heroines in um, video games, and Shantae always just seems like a cool character. And I do like 2D action platformers, so I feel like it's up my alley. I just, I feel like that I missed out on, on the Pirate's Curse Switch game. My collection's incomplete, and I probably should have bought it maybe on the PS5, so I don't feel that sort of FOMO. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that's sort of my collecting dilemma at the moment that I've been undecided about. All right, so last but not least are all of my visual novel or visual novel-like games. So I'm gonna go through these quickly again because just how long this video is turning out to be. Uh, first, starting with all of my Serenity Forge games that I have. And they're not all necessarily visual novels, um, like Genesis Noir. I don't think it's technically a visual novel. Um, they're just some visual novel-like elements. This is why I group them together. And then uh, Doki Doki with Literature Club is a classic kind of psychological horror game, um, if you haven't experienced it yet. And then Coffee Talk um, are recent additions that are kind of a cozy uh, coffee simulator uh, game with uh, some fantastic characters that uh, you meet. Um, and I highly uh, recommend these if you haven't gotten to them yet. And then from Capcom, I have these three games here. I'm starting with uh, Ghost Trick. Um, this is the Asian English um, version um, that has English on the cover. And there's a Japanese version that's a little bit cheaper than this one, um, if you want to get a little cheaper. But I, I, I couldn't pass up um, the version that had English on the um, cover art. This is a remake of a very expensive title on the DS, so I'm very happy this is now available on the Switch and I haven't made time to play it yet, but I've heard nothing but great things about it. And then the Ace Attorney games are also, I think, great pickups for the Switch. Um, unfortunately, you can only import um, the first three games um, from Asia, but there's English on the cart. Um, this is a prequel, um, so it's really cool to have this available on the West. And they recently released the Apollo trilogy that I want to get my hands on at some point. Um, but I need to play through these first. <laughs> I feel like as a visual novel fan, I've missed out on so much not having played the Ace Attorney games yet, but I really need to make an effort this year to at least get through a few of them. And some of my favorite visual novels on the system are AI The Insomnian Files, and I will admit 
the Switch is not necessarily the best way to play these. Um, there are some um, issues I encountered, especially in the Nirvana Initiative uh, sequel that were a little bit kind of janky, but if you get past that, I feel like these are great on the Switch and the story alone I think is very much well worth playing um, if you're into kind of puzzle detective stories. And then the other Digimon game I have is Digimon Survive. And technically this involves some strategy RPG elements, but I will say this is more of a visual novel. And I mean to play this because I've heard so many mixed things about it, especially with the darker story elements that I'm very intrigued by. So I'm hoping to finally play it and tell you guys my impressions on it. Then we have Witch on the Holy Night that I played last year and it's a lovely game. It comes in a great um, special box. And this is the first uh, physical console release we've had of a Type Moon game out in the West uh, of their visual novel line. And so I'm so happy we have this. And we just heard an announcement of the other game coming out in the West on the Switch. So I'll definitely be picking that up once um, more details are revealed about that. So I kind of skipped the publisher ordering, unfortunately, but um, some other Spike Chunsoft games like the AI, the Sami Files, um, is Danganronpa Decadence. And this is a really good way to play all the Danganronpa games um, physically. Unfortunately, there's large patches here. Um, so the Vita versions are kind of considered superior, even though they're wildly, like wildly expensive. Um, but um, if you don't want to pay those prices, definitely get this, I think, on the Switch. And I've been trying to get more of the science adventure games. So I do have um, Chaos, um, the double pack with uh, Chaos Head Noah and Chaos Child. I need to get a few of the other ones that are out. Unfortunately, there are large patches in all of these, but um, this is the only way to get them physically. And I really want to commit to the science adventure uh, series uh, that has Steins Gate and of course all the, the Chaos and robotics games. So. <laughs> It's part of my kind of long wish list. So next is NIS America, and I have two games here that technically are not VNs that I'll um, add at the end. Um, but first up, I have You're a Kill, which is a visual novel that incorporates um, some escape room sort of mechanics and puzzles, um, and also a shoot 'em up, which I think makes it rather unique. Um, I played this um, just over a year ago, and I had fun with it. Um, some of the puzzles were a little odd, and you kind of had to be a little bit knowledgeable about Japanese culture, which I feel like the hints didn't always help with. But um, if you have a guide handy for the ones that really stump you, um, I think it's a pretty cool experience overall. And then I also have um, Process of Elimination that came out last year. And this is the VN that got kind of mixed reviews. Um, I think there's a lot of comparisons to Danganronpa um, and it maybe fell short of people's expectations. Or I'm not totally sure. And then for non-VNs that I'm gonna tack on here, I have Yamawari, um, the Long Night Collection. And so this is more of a horror-esque game rather than a VN. Um, and so it probably should have been in my catch-all uh, pile. And another one that I kind of forgot about that was up there, but I haven't opened it yet, is Void Terrarium. And this is kind of described as a Tamagotchi uh, simulator kind of game where um, you have to help this girl um, survive um, in this little terrarium. Um, and you kind of go out and find materials and things for her to eat and keep her healthy. Um, there's actually a sequel to this and I'm still kind of unsure whether or not I want to keep this. I kind of bought this on a whim when it was on clearance at Best Buy. And once games usually get on clearance over there, it usually is an indicator that it's going to go out of print, um, which I believe this one is now. Um, but with the second game, I don't know if this is kind of obsolete and if the second game is just better overall. So for now, I'm just going to keep in the collection and maybe someday I might feel inclined to play some sort of Tamagotchi kind of simulator game um, and see how it goes. And then a visual novel, or it's more like a point and click adventure, is the Opius collection. And so this contains the Day We Found Earth as well as Rocket of Whispers. And the third um, game actually recently released on the Switch physically that I've been looking into. Though it seems like there's been a lot of printing errors recently on Switch covers that um, have the little label that indicates that a download is necessary in order to play the game. Square Enix did this on accident with uh, Star Ocean Second Story R um, that didn't have a required uh, download, even though it said that on the box. And so um, I feel like with these misprints, it's gonna be very similar to Monster Hunter Stories 2, um, where Capcom made a similar error years ago. And once they re-release these games or reprint them, they're probably gonna take off that logo and that might be when I 
snag it. <laughs> uh, the next three games are my visual novels from Limited Run um, that are, I guess, the numbered ones. Um, the House in Feta Morgana is my most recently finished uh, VN and I actually really enjoyed it. It was a little bit slow to start with because you just have all these characters that are kind of repulsive um, and it was a little bit boring. Um, but once you get to a certain section, um, I could see why this is considered a masterpiece. And then Valhalla here is a bartending simulator game with some VN um, segments. And you can actually get the Japanese version that has English on the cart. Um, so you don't have to be forced to buy the limited run um, version. And then lastly, I have To the Moon here, which I've been kind of putting off because of the subject matter. I know it's going to be a very tearjerker kind of story. And so someday I'll get to it. And last but not least are the rest of my Otome visual novels. And I'm gonna start with the three that I have from Idea Factory. And um, so far I've just played um, most of the routes in Charade Maniacs. Um, I've been going through it kind of slowly because there are a number of routes. So it does take quite a bit um, if you wanna interact with all the different characters. And I do find the premise kind of odd in that there's kind of a sci-fi twist, but it's very kind of homey where everyone was kidnapped and brought to this house and forced to act. And it's kind of like TV drama sort of scenario. So it's certainly an odd one. And then I have Cupid Parasite here that I really want to get to because it's supposed to be very fluffy and lighthearted. And I get to experience a true kind of rom-com sort of VN. Most of the ones that I've been doing have been very dark. So I feel like this would be a nice change of pace. And there's also a fan disc that's coming out, I think very soon for that. And the most recent acquisition I've had is um, my next life as a villainess, All Routes Lead to Doom. And this is based off of a light novel that also has an anime. And um, this actually includes um, a subscription service uh, so that you can read the uh, light novels before playing this game if you haven't gone to them yet. So I think I'm gonna do that and at least read like the first or second a light novel before diving into this because I feel like knowing who these characters are will greatly enhance the experience. And then lastly, I'm gonna go through all the access uh, Otome VNs that I have, and uh, there are quite a few, and a lot that I haven't purchased yet. Um, they've been pumping them out uh, recently, but I have Color X Malice, and this was actually the first Otome VN I played, and it focuses more on the plot um, than it does on the romance, which I I tend to kind of gravitate towards. Uh, this one has a little bit of a weird plot where uh, you play as this uh, policewoman who somehow gets this poison collar around her neck um, that could kill her at any moment. And she has to deal with some sort of terrorist threat and you have to uh, kind of go through all the routes and see which one leads you to kind of saving the city. Um, there's also a fan disc that's out for this that I have yet to get to um, that I've heard pretty good things about. Um, I liked most of the route characters, so I think this will be fun to go through. Another dark Otome VN that I played is P. Fiore, and this one I would say that I really liked half of it, and then the other half of the routes I really disliked. And the routes that I did end up enjoying the most were probably the most problematic ones, which I don't know if that says much about me, but. Uh, it's a very interesting VN, to say the least. Um, but the premise is that you're kind of navigating this Italian mafia while um, trying to learn a little bit more about yourself as the female protagonist. That one also has a fan disc, but I've been a little hesitant to get it because, again, I only enjoyed half the routes. The other half I could have done without. And then the other four games are ones I haven't gotten to yet. Um, starting with uh, this one is, I think, more of like a secret agent kind of with a paranormal twist vibe to it. I don't know too much about it uh, other than it's kind of a little bit a mixed reception. And then Olympia Sorori here um, is I think a very popular one. And this is a fantasy kind of romance, Otome VN, where um, you play as the heroine who is the last of her kind and she has to uh, find a way to extend uh, her bloodline um, and kind of navigate all the uh, almost kind of like racial uh, society issues um, within her uh, clan. And then Cafe Enchante here um, is supposed to be very sweet from what I've heard of it. Um, and you run this um, cafe in Tokyo and all the patrons are these kind of paranormal creatures. So in a way it kind of reminds me of Coffee Talk. So I do want to get to this and uh, kind of see how it goes. 
And then last but not least, I have Variable Barricade. And this is another sort of rom-com sort of a setup where you play as this heiress um, who was given a big, I think, trust fund, but in order for her to receive it, she has to marry some sort of eligible bachelor. And uh, she has kind of uh, her pick uh, to choose from. So um, I've heard pretty good things about it. So I'm sure it'll be a fun time. So those are all the Nintendo Switch games that are currently in my collection. Um, this was quite a long video, so um, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I've always found it fascinating to see how other people collect, so I hope um, kind of my little explanations about uh, my motives for picking up each individual title um, was insightful or interesting to you guys. So curate collecting, I think, is a lot of fun, though it can be a very long and extensive process. For me, that is okay. I find a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment um, doing the research, um, being very selective and deliberate with my um, purchases, and then getting to experience these games that I'm so excited for. And um, I can just continue to see myself doing this uh, for the years to come. And as my backlog grows uh, larger, that just means there's more opportunities to find a lot of great games that will suit my taste. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and until my next one, bye guys.